Genesis chapter 25. Matter of fact, stand with me. Let's play church. Genesis chapter 25. I'm not being, well, anyway. Genesis 25. Go down to verse 19. Genesis 25 verse 19. So this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, If all is well, why am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. I'm going to stop right there. We see if we read on that verse 24, so it was that they were birthed, they were twins. We understand that's what God was speaking of, but something even much more. Let's pray right now. Father, we just thank you. We exalt you. We adore you. We extol you. We say there is nobody like you. You are God in heaven. We are here in earth, but our hearts are toward you. We love you, God. We praise you tonight. You said that you would inhabit the praises of your people, so come be here. Let heaven come near. Rip the heavens open, God, and just step down. Pour in to us. Pour out from heaven, God. We need you. We want you. We're a dependent people. You are all sufficient, and you are all we need, so come, Lord. Let your will be done. Let nothing stand in the way of that. We declare and we hope and we, we pray for total victory in this place. That your will is being accomplished and nothing else and nothing less. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Glory to God. I'm going to uh, grab your Bible. Don't put it away. Don't put it under your seat or in your purse or whatever. Keep your Bible. Keep it open. Go to the New Testament now. John chapter 11. permission to blow your mind. Thank you very much. We will proceed. John chapter 11. This is a sermon within a sermon within a sermon within a sermon. And so if you've heard some of what I'm about to share, know that I'm not preaching this sermon. It's just, it's, it's a stepping stone. It's a point within sermons tonight, okay? That doesn't mean buckle up and hold on that we're going to be here all night. We're only going to be here half the night, so okay? Don't worry about that. John chapter 11, get in your Bible, go down in this chapter all the way down to, we could read it all, it's all good, but down to verse 34, we'll say. This is Jesus. He knew that Lazarus, his friend, had been sick. Lazarus, his friend, had been sick. Jesus did not come immediately. They even wondered why Jesus didn't go immediately. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. And Jesus, after Lazarus, Lazarus has died. Jesus said to his disciples, see that word hadn't even reached them yet, but Jesus said, Lazarus is sleeping, let's go wake him up. And they said, well, if he's sleeping, why would we? Jesus said, no, 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 you don't understand. He's dead. So they went and, and they went to the place where Lazarus was. In verse 34, we jump into the story. And he, Jesus, said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Emotional tug and pull for a lot of different reasons. But Jesus was moved. Verse 36, the Jews said, see how he loved him. Verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Jesus again. Now I want you to notice this because this is not proper church behavior. This is Holy Ghost stuff right here. We need more Holy Ghost stuff in our churches. Jesus right here, verse 38. This is what I'm talking about. Then Jesus again groaning in himself came to the tomb he approached the tomb groaning within himself. If you study that out, it's almost like there was this... If you were close to Jesus, you would hear this almost like a growl. Jesus was fired up. He was psyched up. 
pumped up. I mean, he's ready to go up, and 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 Raz, Lazarus is been he's getting ready to be raised up. So Jesus is groaning within himself, and he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Verse thirty nine. Jesus said, "Take away the stone." Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, "Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he's been dead four days." Zach, you got a sister, so you know what that's like. You've been dead four days. Jesus is about to raise you from the dead, but all Katie can say is, but Jesus, he's been dead four days. He's going to stink. You know, if you got a sister, you know what I'm talking about right there. But anyway, verse, verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus was lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Verse 43, and when he had said this, these things, he cried with a loud voice again, with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Now I want to tell you a story real quick, if I can. This, this uh, has to be said for us to understand the, the totality of, of what I'm talking about, what, we get, uh, what we're going to get to. I, I had a dream several years back. I had a dream. This dream, I, I guess I had this dream in 2001, I believe it was. And in 2001, I had this dream. The dream was this. I was, I was standing in church after a church service somewhere around the front. You know how we are. We'll, we'll talk and we'll linger after a church service, especially when it's been a good church service. Nobody wants to leave. We're all just kind of hanging out and talking and being friendly. And so I was, I was talking. I, I could tell it was right after a church service and was talking to a few people. And then somebody came inside from outside and they approached me and they, they, they butted their head right in and said, have you heard about the revival that's happening somewhere and and they and they said oh it's a mighty move of god and we were like wow and then they just left a few minutes later we're all just still just socializing somebody else came in and they said hey have you guys heard about the outpouring that's going on over and this was a different place or said no no they said oh man god is really and so then they left so we continue to talk fellowship ain't no ship like a fellowship so we're fellowshipping that's what church people do do you use that term in any other circle? Anyway, we're, we're fellowshipping. And so as we're fellowshipping, somebody else comes in. And they said, hey, 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 did you hear about the, the, did you hear about the, the glory of God that's happening and being poured out over in, and this was another place. And we're saying, no, no. And they're, oh, man, you won't believe what's happening. And then they just leave. Another person walks up to me, and this person says, oh, have you guys heard of the outpouring and, and what, what's happening over? And it was a different place. And then they leave. And as they were leaving, I was trying to think of that place. And as I'm trying to think, now where is that? I Even in my dream, I scratched my head trying to think, now where is that? Somebody comes to me, this person I knew. It was a pastor's wife, a friend of ours, a really good friend of ours from Tennessee. And she was in the dream and walked right up to us. A congregation, you know, a, a group of us standing there. She walked right up to me and said, you don't have to figure that out right now, meaning the place she said, what you need to know and remember is the number 44. She said, it will mean something to you. It will be a sign to you. And so I said, okay. And she said, God is about to do a mighty move. But there is getting ready to be a great work of the Lord released upon this land. And you will see a mighty Holy Ghost revival. It's coming. Remember 44. Dreams over, I felt the glory of God in my bedroom. Goosebumps on top of goosebumps. Goosebumps so large you could, uh, you could probably hang a Texas cowboy hat on them. I mean, I just really feeling something. Anybody ever feel the presence of God? I hope that's a bunch of you. So I could feel God in my room. I was excited. I just had a God dream. I knew it was a God dream. I could feel, I could feel heaven in my bedroom. It's in the middle of the night. It's dark, but I could just feel God. And after, after just, I, I sat up and I'm just feeling God. It was like God was in the room somewhere. My eyes, you know, couldn't adjust hardly to the dark, you know, and I couldn't see anything, but I knew God was there. I could feel God. I could feel the presence of God. I knew that God just gave me a revelation. And after a few minutes passed, you know, just soaking in whatever it was I received, then I realized, whatever was this that I just received? What does that mean? What does that mean? The number 44, it'll be a sign to me. Pay attention, watch for that. The number 44, remember 44. Okay, this is where it gets weird, guys. 
And listen, I didn't, I, listen, when I, when I got called into the ministry and stuff, I didn't sign up for the weird stuff. I never volunteered and said, God, call me into the weird stuff. I never asked for it. I, I, I've tried for years. I've really tried for years to be normal. Promise you, I have. And it just doesn't work out for me. I mess that up every time. And, and so, you know, it, it just it is what it is. And so God gave me this dream, this 44 dream. I did not know until that point that God can speak through numbers. God can. I'm finding out that there are hardly any limits to how and what God can speak to us through. Listen, in the, we mentioned last night in the Old Testament, God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. God has spoke through so many different... God can th speak through men. God gave, God gave wicked kings holy dreams in your Bible. Just nod your head. You don't have to understand it. You just know it's true. So God can speak through people that sometimes we don't even <laughs> want Him to speak through. So I say that God speaks through men, but God also, and you might not like this one either, God speaks through women. Some people don't like that. Some people just want to really emphasize that point that women should remain silent, you know? And they want to sit them down and shut them up. Well, glory to God and bless you, sister, for hearing the call of God upon your life. Amen. Thank you. And any other women, you know, that you have the gifts of the Spirit and stuff. I mean, listen, God said He's going to pour out His Spirit in the last days upon your sons and only your sons. <laughs> Your sons and your daughters, and they'll prophesy, you know? How are they going to do that? Are they going to become Charlie Brown's teacher? Because we put a button on their mouth? No, God wants them to speak. And, and so that's part of it. God can speak through so many different things. God can speak through a rooster. God can speak through, yeah. And so, I ain't saying that, but you, you know it's true. And God can, and well, yeah, he speaks through a donkey, and he speaks through you, he speaks through me, he can speak. And so, when I had this dream, this one was a new, a new thing for me. The number 44, remember it, it'll be a sign to you, it'll mean something to you. And I, I struggled at first with, with crossing that hurdle. Can God speak through numbers? Do numbers have meaning? And I'm not going to do an exhaustive teaching on that because I could. I could exhaust you because I've studied it a lot trying to come to grips with it. But, but let me just condense it in this. Yes, God can and God does. Think in your head for a second. Are there certain numbers in the Bible that just seem to show up more than others? Yes, and that's the first thing that I did. Okay, let me think. Can numbers, can God speak through? And I thought, well, yeah, seven. Seven's in the Bible a lot. God seems to like that number. Twelve? Yeah, God seems to, you know, be a little bit repetitive. Twelve tribes and twelve apostles. and there's all. That. So I began to realize, okay, there are some numbers that seem like God picked them. And, and God does things through those numbers. Three. We, we talked about some threes last night, you know. Out of court, inner court, ho holy of holies. You know, Father, Son, ho Holy Ghost, you know. All that. So, so we talked about threes. So I realized, wait a minute, there, that there, there are numbers that God uses and God moves through. So what is this that God could be speaking to me about the number 44? And so I, I found out that some people, theologians even, have studied numbers in Scripture and what they mean. And so I got a great big book on this subject by a well-respected theologian who had studied numbers throughout Scripture and what they mean. And I was so excited. I got the book, and, and I'm, I'm flipping through it all past all these other numbers, and I get to number 39 and what it means. 41, what it means. Flipping over. 42, 43, 45. What? you got to be kidding me. He had stuff on all kinds of different numbers, but there was nothing on 44. I was frustrated. I wanted to throw the book away. I wanted to kick that guy in the shin. It, it, it aggravated me. And I'd studied and searched and prayed and fasted. Promise, I did. I, I really looked for. I went to the library and, and I went to Christian bookstores and I went online and I spent hours and hours and hours and I, I called my smart friends and I wouldn't let everybody know that I was studying a sermon about the number 44. I thought, this sounds crazy. People already think I'm crazy. I'm not telling anybody about this one. But I did talk to just a few smart friends, you know, that really are just, their nose is always in the Bible and they're going to know and I'll just call them and they just had nothing they had nothing had nothing but but sympathy for me you know and so I I left it alone for a while you know, a little bit but not totally and I, I really began to pray and ask God I said Lord please 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 I read every 
I read every chapter 44 in the Bible. And, you know, they were all good. good. The one, but still, it's just I didn't feel like that connection was. And so finally I just gave up. And I told God, I said, God, you're going to have to show me this. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it and I can't find And then one day the Lord spoke to me. I was so grateful. And God said, it's not chapter 44. Just as I was finishing the last, you know, the chapter 44s. There's not a whole bunch of them. But anyway, as I was reading the last chapter 44. The Lord spoke to me and he said, it's not chapter 44. It's verse 44. And he didn't tell me what book. He didn't tell me what chapter. He didn't tell me Old Testament, New Testament. So I think, okay, great. You know? And so I start to, and I thought, no, 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 I ain't going to do this. I, I'm not going to risk even messing it up. Guessing which one of these verse 44 is it. God, you're going to have to show me. I'm giving you my ears and my heart and my everything. I'm looking, I'm searching. Speak to me. Show me this thing. And, and, and a good while would go on with nothing. I was, I was walking through my living room to go out and mow the grass. The TV was on, and I didn't even realize what was on, and I, I wasn't really paying attention. I was just going through the living room to the backyard to mow the grass. When I get outside in the backyard and mowing grass, it hits me. Wait a minute. It's like subliminally I heard something that I didn't really notice it at the time. My brain seems to only focus on one thing at a time. A lot of men are prone to that. Let me hear it. Amen from the women. And so... <laughs> Um, and, and, and so, I, you know, I'm focused on mowing the grass. I don't pay attention to anything. I'm just mowing the grass. I get out there, and then it dawns on me what I just heard as I was passing through the living room. Perry Stone was on the TV preaching, and no kidding, I got about through the second, you know, walk through of the back of my yard, and it hit me. Wait a minute. Did he say something about a, a, a number 43? And so I thought, man, he's talking about numbers, and if he's at 43, maybe he's going to talk about four. And it stopped the lawnmower, and I ran in the house. And he had just released a book, and he was talking about it, and he had all kinds of information about the number 43. And he said, it's a, it's, it's a chapter in this book. And there was a guy in our church that he loves Perry Stone. He buys everything that Perry Stone puts out. So I called him, Brother Jim, Brother Jim. Do you have that new book by Perry Stone? He said, yes, I do. I said, I'm coming to your house right now to get it. He said, okay. <laughs> I hang up the phone. I didn't give him a choice. I didn't say, can I borrow it? I said, I'm coming to get it. And, uh, and so I do. I drive to his house, and I get there, and I ring the doorbell, and he brings me the book, and he says, by the way, it's funny you call. I was just thinking about you. He don't know why I want the book. By the way, it's just part of one chapter, the number 43. It's just part of one chapter. It's a whole book of just other stuff. And he says, it's funny you call me because I was thinking about you and I felt like I needed to call you. And I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, why? And he said, because I was in a, I was in a shop, like a trophy shop today, and I seen this plaque on the wall and it had the number 11 engraved and all this different stuff about the number 11. As I was reading it, I found it interesting and I thought, I need to tell Shane about that. Well, I was not appreciative. I was not happy, not in the least little bit, because nobody knows it, but I'm on the search for the meaning and the understanding of the number 44, and now God wants to give me another different number altogether. And I'm like, oh, thanks, Jim. And so I leave, and I don't tell him anything. And I go to that trophy shop the next morning. It's hanging on the wall, just like he said. I said, that, that, that plaque on the wall. I said, how much is that? Is that for sale? And they said, no, it's not for sale. So I pull out my wallet and I lay down, I don't remember, a 5, a 10, a 20 or something. I said, can I buy that plaque? <laughs> they said, okay. Money talks, I guess. You know, and they gave it to me and I went home and I studied all this stuff about this number 11. It was, it was pretty fascinating. Pretty fascinating. It wasn't really from a biblical perspective, but it showed it like at 9-11. By the way, if you, 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 I'm so good at math. If you add 9 plus 1 plus 1, it's 11. It's 11. And so, but it had all this stuff of the tragedy of 9 11 and how many times the number 11 showed up in that tragedy. And it was amazing. You know, the f f one of the flights was 11. There was in one of the flights, you know, the, the numbers of people on the flights and the, it was just everywhere. And one of the, one of the terrorists, his, or, or, or all the terrorists, I don't remember their names. To, I, I've got a whole list of this stuff. You would not believe how much crazy research, research I have on these things. Like New York City. Let's see. Somebody count this up for me. Just count up New York City. Does that come to 11? N-E-W. Come on, y'all. Yes, okay, thank you. That would have messed up the whole sermon. Okay, glad that was right. And by the way, is the 11th state added to the Union? 
I mean, just stuff all over the place. And this guy from Iraq or Iran, you know, and, and by the way, if you were to call from here then, I don't know if it still is, but if you were to call from here then, it, the, the area code, what you'd have to punch in was 119. And again, this is my good math. 1 plus 1 plus 9 equals 11. And so, I mean, this 11 stuff was all over that plaque and other things that I added to it and discovered and found, you know, and I'm like, this is fun, this is cool, you know. And I'm like, wait a minute, why am I studying this 11 stuff? And, and all of this isn't from the Bible. Some of it is from the Bible. Then I go to this, this, this research and this stuff that is theological. It comes straight from the Bible, and this is what I find about the number 11. You'll hear different things. Different people have different perspectives of the number 11. Some people have a very redeemed, um, a positive approach to the number 11. They say it is the number of the prophet, like the 11th hour or the hour just before the midnight hour and that final hour, the foretelling of what is about to happen, and that all sounds good and great. I see it more like this. The number 11 is a number of disorder, chaos, even destruction. Woohoo! And here, I've got reasons for believing that from what I got in, in a lot of different research. And also, if you think about Jesus, he picked how many? Twelve. And 12 is a perfect number. 12 is a perfect number. And, and, and then when, when he picked 12, oh, there's so much I've got to skip and edit here. But when he picked 12, after Judas killed himself, that leaves 11. They're in Acts chapter 1, and they're praying for the promise. You know, they're waiting for the promise. And they can't leave and can't do anything until the Holy Ghost comes and fills that place. So while they're in there praying and waiting for the promise, all of a sudden in Acts chapter 1, they had a business meeting because it occurs to them, we're in a state of 11. Jesus started us as a group with 12, but we are now just 11. Let's appoint another. So they went from 11 to to 12, and when af shortly after getting back to 12, now I know it was the timing, everything was the timing, but then they were all together in one accord in one place, and the Holy Spirit came and filled that place. Okay? So they, it, 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 the whole message there is order is important. Order is important. God does everything. God is a God of order. And so, so you, when, when you see that, it was important to them in Acts chapter 1 to get out of the 11 and get back to 12. Uh, 10 is a perfect number. A lot of times we'll rate and judge stuff, gymnastics or something. They'll hold up them placards, and it's if they do real good, really, 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 really good, we'll hold up that 10, you know? And, and so that's perfect right there. But you ever heard this saying, if you find the perfect church, don't go there? Because you'll mess it up. I'm trying not to look at anybody when I say that, because you'll mess it up, you know? Because if you add something to what's perfect, you'll mess it up. You know, you got a perfect recipe. If you add too much salt or too much sugar or too much, you know, of something, you'll mess it up. And also, it's the same as, you know, if you if 12 is a perfect number, if that's what Jesus started with, if you take something away from it, it's no longer perfect. And so we've got to understand the order here. So I'm, I'm thinking, God, you've got me on this chase of 44. But now you're speaking to me about the number 11. I don't get it, but there it is. I'm studying it, and I've got a good grasp. I've got more of a grasp on 11 now than I do 44. I've got nothing on 44. Why won't you give me some? And then I came across a, a clue. Ruh -roh. I come across a, a crew, across a clue, and I'm excited. And, and what it was is, as I'm studying numbers, one guy that had devoted much of his life to studying numbers in Scripture said that many times if you see numbers like 33, it might be an emphasis, emphasis of Three, it's, it's the double. Matter of fact, whenever Jesus in Bible repeats himself, it's the same reason that you repeat yourself. You want somebody to really hear it. If you repeat yourself to your kids, maybe they didn't hear it. You want to make sure they hear it. And you see repeats in the Bible. Verily, verily, I say unto you. You know, and Jesus wants to emphasize that point. So when you see double digits... Or the repeating of numbers, it might be the emphasis of that singular number. So I'm thinking, okay, that's cool, that's good. That's, uh, and so what I did is I immediately began to go and search out four. Because I'm, 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 I'm seeing this in this dream, 44. So I'm thinking, I'm going to get it. If I just go to four, I'll get it. And sort of, but not really. When I got to four, I got all this information. And God began to speak to me from the number four. And I felt the anointing while I was studying the number four. And I'm thinking, God, hallelujah, praise you, Lord, for giving me the number four. But now, really, all I've got is the number 11. And I've got the number four. 
Because number four, I knew was not what I was supposed to get with the 44, even though I didn't know what I was supposed to get. I just knew that wasn't it. Number four, I won't go into a whole message, although I could. On the number four, I say is a number of creation. God manifests Himself as Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and then fourthly, through creation. Everything else is a created thing. And so I also even condense that more, simplify it to say it is a number of creativity. He's the creator. Create. So anyway, so I've got this stuff on the number four. I've got this stuff on the number 11. And then I'm going to preach somewhere one night. I never preached there before. And I'm going to preach there. The pastor that, that day called me and he, he gave me directions to the church. And my wife was with me and, and she was... Um, I drive most of the way. When I got almost there, I said, Honey, now let's switch. You drive the rest of the way. I'm just going to read over my scriptures. Now, the reason I wanted to read over my scriptures again is because the scriptures that I was going to be preaching out of that night are the same ones that I read to you just a second ago in this text. Not the Old Testament, but the New Testament scriptures. When I, when I just read those, that's the scriptures because when I was preaching that night, the Lord spoke to me that day and God spoke to me and I said, God, because everything I had tried to prepare and preach that night, it's like the Lord said, no, it is not good. <laughs> you, know, it's like, you know, when he created stuff, he said, it is good. Every sermon I put together, God was like, no, that's not me, no. I mean, it was good stuff, I think, but God was totally unimpressed and I knew that I didn't have what God wanted to speak to that people on that night. Finally, I just went with nothing. I said, God, what do you want to say? And the Lord spoke to me and God said, Lazarus. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And everything I tried to put together on Lazarus was just a flop. It was like, God was, no, 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 no. So I'm thinking, okay, God, that's fine. You want to do this? Well, let's do this. I'm going in there, and I've got one, I don't have one sermon. I've got one word, and it's your fault. It's your fault, God. It's totally your fault. You won't give me anything, and everything I come up with, you say no to. So I'm going there with one word. So I'll tell you what, I was bargaining with God because I was frustrated. I said, I'll go in there and I'll just read the verses here about this story of Lazarus. So that's what I was going to do. So I got close and I said to my wife, I said, you drive the rest of the way. I'm going to go over these scriptures because I was hoping now God would give me something. It would all just kind of come out. Oh, and it was not. So after I finished reading the scriptures that I, you know, had highlighted or whatever that I was going to use for my message, there was nothing coming. So I went to close my Bible. As I closed my Bible, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, read it again. So I opened my Bible. And I read it again. Okay. So I closed my Bible. Holy Spirit spoke to me. Read it again. Okay. Read through them verses again. So I go to close my Bible. This time I kept my thumb there. <laughs> read it again. So I flip it open. This time I read slowly. I read the side notes. I read them little letters beside it, you know. I, I, I pronunciated all the words. And, Lazar and my wife was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just read quietly. And so I'm trying to... Re and no kidding, I'm really doing this. I'm trying to really... Because I know I'm missing something. And I read it, read it, read it. And every time, God said, read it again, read it again. So I'm reading it this time. And as I'm finishing at the last verse that I had highlighted to read that night, the story of Lazarus, I read it. And as I'm getting to that last verse, I thought, I've got to get it now because I haven't got it yet. And I'm reading out of verse 44. When I realized the last verse that I had highlighted that I was supposed to read out of, God hadn't gave me a sermon. He just gave me this. He just okayed me to read it. And when I got in the last verse that I had highlighted, by the way, it's the same scriptures that we just read a minute ago. Verse 44. I'll give it to you. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. It's the story where Lazarus was resurrected and came forth and got loosed. And I was, I was not even about the subject matter. I was excited about the number of the verse that I was reading. And I got to getting excited and squirming around in my seat, you know, feeling all Pentecostal over there, you know, and it's leather seats, so I was sliding around anyway you know whoo, glory hallelujah and and my wife said what what, what, what is it <laughs> and I'm like it's the verse <laughs> glory to God you know I'm getting excited and 
she's just like, okay, you know, she, she just keeps driving. And I said, now, honey, uh, up here, we're going to get to this red light and turn right. The pastor said, get to the first red light, turn right. Woo, glory to God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Woo, glory, hallelujah, woo. You know, I'm excited, I'm feeling good. Months, months I've searched for anything on the number 44. Boom, boom, now i got a verse. I know what, well, I don't know what it means yet, but i got something, you know. And so I'm, I'm excited, I'm feeling, feeling, feeling good. And, and we get to the light and we turn right. And, and, you know, and I'm reading this verse again, and then I'm reading it again, and my wife interrupts me and says, Honey, is this the road? I, yeah, the light turned right. She said, So we're on the right road. And I look up and there's a sign. Highway 44. Honey, is this the road? Yes, this is the road. This is the road, this is the road, this is the road. I didn't know I was going to be preaching on Highway 44. I'm preaching out of verse 44. On Highway 44. Glory to God. I go in and preach, and I didn't tell them the 44 stuff because I didn't really know what it meant yet. But I preached on Lazarus, and he was dead. But God brought him back to life again. And God wants to do that for anybody and everybody, you know, the people that he loves, he calls. And, and so I preached that just real short and sweet. And I said, if you got a hunger for more of God, and the Lord wants to touch you tonight. Come on up here. We're going to pray for you. And we started praying for people. The pastor had came up to the front with me and said, let's pray for the people. So he and I were walking side by side to go pray for the people. And as we're going to pray for people, he stops. I look at him. He said, you go on. So I go on. I'm praying for people. Boom, 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 just like that. Not literally, but I'm praying for people. And he's, he's standing back. After I finish praying for people, he says, i got to tell you all something. I don't know what this means, but the Lord spoke to me. Just as we were getting ready to start praying for people, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, the Lord told me to count the people that were here in the front. And he said, and I did, and there were 43. And then you, lady, you came up here and made it 44. And he didn't know this 44 stuff was going on in my head. Ooh, I wanted to run around the inside of the church and then the outside of the church too. I just, whoo, hallelujah. I still don't know fully what it means. I was going to preach uh, shortly shortly around that same time. I was going to preach at this, uh, they, they called it a camp meeting. First one they had put together and they called it, I, I didn't even know the name of it. They just called me to come preach and I was going to preach. When I get there, um, actually before I left, a mechanic called me. He's a Holy Ghost guy and he called me. He says, Brother Shane, can I go with you tonight? I said, well, sure, sure. He said, where are you going? Uh, he didn't even know where I, he, he said I was underneath of a car working and the Lord spoke to me and told me to call you and go with you wherever you were going tonight I said well I'm going to preach tonight he said good he said I'm going with you and so we get, we get in the car and we're driving and, and things and as we're driving the Lord the Lord starts speaking through this brother and he said listen God's speaking to me to tell you he said I feel like the Lord's getting ready to do something with resurrection power resurrection power something about resurrection I said well that sounds good that sounds good brother you know and I didn't really want it to distract me from what I was focused on because I got a preach, you know, got all this, you know, got to focus and stuff, and he's sharing other stuff, which is good, you know, and I'm listening to him, and then we get to the church, and we pull into the parking lot, and we get to the door, there's a glass door, and it had a sign and a picture, and had my name on it and stuff, and then it says, uh, welcome everybody to Resurrection Camp Meeting, and I stopped and looked at the door, and I looked at him, I thought, whoa, that's interesting. So I preached, you know, my message. I don't know what I preached on. Something, and then we prayed for people in the altar. And there was this one young man. He fell out in the power of God. Boom. Real. I mean, God touched him real big. God touched him real strong. He was shaking all over the place from head to toe. He's shaking. I believe every muscle in his body was shaking and twitching and jerking and vibrating and stuff. I mean, you, you, bow. I never seen, I've been in church my whole life, and I've never seen somebody jerk this much. Every, I think everything in him was shaking and vibrating. Uh, and, and, and so after I'd prayed for everybody, everybody else was eventually getting getting up and going back. He was not. He's still laying there just shaking. I'm afraid something's going to shake loose on him. And, I, and, and I, so I just came back up to the platform. Pastor, I know, is getting ready to dismiss service in just a second. I'm just watching him. You know, I've seen all kinds of Pentecostal things, and this is good, man. It's like, wow. And so as I'm watching him shake and vibrate and jerk and twitch and everything, boom, 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 you know, just whoo. And, and then all of a sudden, he, he starts, his feet stop shaking, and then his legs start shaking, and then his torso sort of, you know, subsides. And his, now it's just his arms. And then from just his arms, it's just his hands. And then, I'm not kidding you guys, I'm not making this up to make a cool sermon. I'm not making it, but it was just his fingers. And I'm watching that, and I thought, and I actually said to myself, sitting on that chair, you got to be kidding me. You got, I, cannot, I cannot believe what I was seeing. <sighs> the 
The next night I'm preaching there and this elderly man, and still I'm not telling people because it's so weird and I don't understand it, you know, and I, and I tell you, I try to be normal. I try. And so this, this elderly gentleman comes up to me at the end of the service, you know. I, I mean, he, 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 was, he was an old man, real old, really old, almost as old as Lou. I mean, this old guy. <laughs> So he, he, he approached me, and as he came to me, um, he said to me, he said, Brother Shane, can I ask you a question? I said, sure, certainly. Sorry, Brother Lou. And um, he said, well, I got a question. He said, God spoke something to me, and I don't know really why and what it all means. And I said, well, what is it, brother? And he says, well, he said, I was worshiping God during the time of singing and stuff. And he said, I was worshiping God and I felt the Lord so much that I just got down on my knees and my eyes closed, my hands lifted, just worshiping the Lord. And he said, God told me to get, get the change out of my pocket. And he said, and I heard God so, so specifically tell me to do that. And so I did. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I just set it on the chair beside me. I got the change out of the, out of the pocket and put it on the chair. He said, what, what does that mean? Why would God... And I was on the spot having to give the wisdom of the Lord and the oracles of the kingdom, you know, to this old man. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, maybe the Lord's speaking to you something about change. And, you know, I made it sound real good. And I said, sometimes it's just important when God speaks something to us, it could be like a test of obedience. And if you obey God in these small things, God's developing your ear and, and, he's, and it, I made it sound good. And he said, yeah. I could tell he wasn't buying anything I was saying or selling. And he said, yeah. And he just, he, 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 he breathed real deep and he just turned away to walk from me. And he said, yeah, I just don't know what that 44 cents means. <laughs> and my mouth just dropped open and I watched him walk away. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't either. So I, I go and I'm preaching, and I'm preaching at a youth convention, a state youth convention, and, uh, you know, there's just, it's a big old coliseum, not a coliseum, but it's a big old room, and there's just teenagers there from all over the state in Kentucky, and I'm, and I'm preaching, and I'm just preaching up a storm. I'm feeling the Lord and praying for people, and then as it's, as it's ending, this one other girl, you know, his service is about to dismiss, but she came up to me and says, Brother Shane, Brother Shane. So I step over here to the side, and she says, teenage girl, she said, well, you were preaching. i got to tell you this. I don't even know why i got to tell you this. She says, but I don't understand it. Well, you were preaching she said there was this see there was this decorative banner lattice made out of wood something over top of my head in an arch and they had balloons stuck all in it she said while you were preaching the lord spoke to me and told me to count the balloons she said there's 44 of them up there i said really go back to your seat I'm then preaching in Tennessee. I'm preaching in Tennessee. And I'm preaching. I'm just trying to obey God and serve the kingdom and be a good person and mind my own business and be normal. And I can't be normal because God speaks to a guy who's about 25 years old and he's, he's, he should be listening to me preach, but instead he's listening to God. And God tells him to count the letters on the banner on the wall. They had a scripture wrote out on the wall. And while I'm preaching, he's not paying attention. He's counting the letters in the banner on the wall. And he came to me and he says, Brother, the Lord spoke to me, told me to count the letters. And he says, there's 44. I said, nice. Nice, that's just great. Wonderful. Glad. I said, God, I'm praying and I'm, I'm driving somewhere to preach. And I said, God, I don't know what this means. I've been faithful. I've studied. I've fasted. I've, I've searched. I'm looking for a meaning in this. What does this mean? Why did you come to me? God, maybe it wasn't even you. Maybe it was just pizza. I just had a dream and I thought it was you. Because God, I'm tired and I'm not finding anything. I don't have any meaning on this. I said, but God, if it is you, I, I won't quit if it is you. But you're going to have to right now let me know at least that it was you. Let me know and let me know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Convince me. About that time, one of the greatest miracles you'll ever see happen. I was passed on the interstate by a semi. Some of you got that. Well, anyway, the semi passed me. On the back of that semi, somebody had rode in the dust and the muck and the mire of the back door of that semi. Four, four. And I'm thinking at this point, God has got a sense of humor. 
nonetheless, I'm feeling something, thinking, God, maybe. Maybe maybe that was you. Maybe that's just dust on the back of a door. I can't go preach sermons in churches, you know, in places. From yeah, i got to give a text. People, people want their gospel in neat packages. You know, I can't say, stand, and the text is going to be what i just seen on the back of that semi-door. God, come on now. you got to help me. And something catches my eye, a great big sign on the side of the interstate. It catches my eye, and I turn and look, and it said, for sale, 44 acres. So I get to praying in the Holy Ghost. I get to feeling the Lord and I'm worshiping God. I'm driving. I'm driving on down the interstate. And I get to thinking. Because sometimes when I get in the Spirit and I get to worshiping and praying and stuff, whew, I check out. You know, I told you my mind is usually one focus, one track. You know, And I get to thinking, oh man, have I passed my, my exit? I've done that before. I got to stop and pay attention. Quit praying, quit worshiping a second. Got to pay attention. Where am I at? Where am I at? Looking for the next sign. The next sign just happened to say, mile marker 44. No kidding. I'm not making this stuff up, people. This really happened. So i got to pay attention because I'm getting close to where I need to be. I get to the exit off of the interstate, and I take the ramp, and I drive into the town, and the bank tells me what time it is, and then after telling me what time it is, it tells me what temperature it is. Guess. Yeah, it's 44 degrees coming and going. 44 was haunting me. It was in my face. It was everywhere. It was in the change of, uh, of the elderly man. It was, you know, in the balloons. It was in the writing on the wall. It was in the dust on the back of a truck. It's on the sign on the wall. It's on the highway. I mean, it's everywhere. That night, it began to unravel for me when I preached out of verse 44. This story is the story of Lazarus. By the way, it is the fourth gospel, and it is the 11th chapter. If you'll remember, this began in chapter, or the Lord giving me the number 11 and the number 4. God was dropping clues, but also if you go 11 times 4, you've got 44. And so there's so many little pieces that I can't connect for you, but God began to give me this 44 thing then. And verse 44 is the meaning in a nutshell, that God is about to do, not just for this guy named Lazarus, but we are about to experience John chapter 11, verse 44, in this nation. We are about to experience, and see, and you say, but what? What are we, what, what are we about to experience? We are, mm-hmm, we're about to, and I've been preaching this for a while now. Ever since I started getting this, I've been preaching this. That we're about to experience revival because if you remember all the way back to the dream, the dream was revival's just breaking out all over the place. Okay? And, and, revi- and so I believe that what you see in verse, uh, verse 44 of cha- chapter 11 in the fourth gospel is revival. See, revi- you have to understand the word revival. It is, uh, uh, the root of it is revive. And that is a medical term. See, and, and you don't, listen, you don't revive a flu. And you don't revive somebody that had their leg broke. Who do you revive? You revive somebody that just stopped breathing, you know. You, you try to revive them, and you, and you try to bring them back to life. Listen, we need a revival. We don't need a pill. We don't need a program. We don't need cheerleaders. We, we need revival. We need CPR. We need the wind to breathe into us again. You know, we need to come back to life. We need God to do that. We need, and, and by the way, to revive something like that, what is it? It's a, it's a resurrection. Resurrection is the ultimate form of revival. Where do you see that in Scripture? You see it in places like Ezekiel 37. I start to say 47. That's the river rising from level to level to level. But 37, you see it in Ezekiel 37. In Ezekiel 37, the valley of the dead dry bones, and they come to life again. And they were, they were nothing but dead. And so what we are about to see is revival. And I've been preaching this. I've been preaching this from 44. It's been the sermon. When I preach 44, this is what I preach. I say revival is coming. God's about to bring us back to life again. And I'm feeling that right now. And I declare it. We're about to experience revival. God's about to bring us back to life again. Oh, but hold on. I said this was a sermon within a sermon within a sermon within a sermon. So here's the rest of this. That is a sermon right here. But now get this. That's only part of it. See, the, uh, the resurrection was only one miracle within two miracles there. Verse 44 is not really the, the resurrection. Verse 43 is the resurrection. 
Mind you, and Perry Stone in that book on 43, what he had researched and found out that all over the globe there were different continents and tribes and jungles and, and, and major countries that were all, and he just discovered it, that were in the 43rd consecutive leader, whether it be an emperor or a president or, you know, just the king of the little hut, you know. But he, he found out so many different countries and tribes and, you know, and, and communities had their 43rd consecutive, and at that time, we did too, George W. Bush. Now we have our 44th president in the, in the United States of America right now. This is the time of the 44. But here is something. Get this. We, we are living in the time that God wants to bring us back to life again. We are living in a time that God wants to resurrect us, that God wants to bring revival. We're living in that time, and we're living in a time that we need revival. But I don't know that it's what everybody wants. I've never seen revival being as unpopular as it is right now. I hear messages against revival. I hear some people mention revival and other people seem like they cringe. Pastors and leaders, they don't like it. I'm telling you, revival will use you up. It'll spend you. God needs you to be available and, and he will absolutely use you up. It will take everything you've got Revival, listen, some people have said I've interviewed pastors who have experienced major revivals and what they say to me, and I'm not going to give their names, but major pastors have said this. This is their quote about revival. Revival is hell because it'll wear you out. It is so hard to manage. It is, there's so much going on. R.W. Shambach said this, revival flows with two rivers. Revival brings two rivers, and you'll get whichever one you're ready for. It'll bring the river of life, and it'll really cause things to happen. Or, if you don't want it, and you're not ready for it, then it'll bring destruction, and it'll tear you up. And I have found that to be true. If you're not ready, meaning you don't have the wineskin to hold what God pours in, you'll just bust, man. I've seen it played out in revivals, even in, in very small churches. You get in revival, and some people don't like it. Some people don't want it. I've had revivals break out. I had a revival break. Oh, I started to give you the city. Y'all would know the city. Not, not in Illinois. But I had revival and it broke out, not because of me, it just happened. And when it did, shortly thereafter, after it went into the second week, a few of the pastor's council approached the pastor and said, we're thinking about leaving the church. We're going ahead and resigning our position. And he said, why? What's wrong? What happened? And they said, revival. That's not our mission. It's not our vision. This is something new that you're dumping on us. It's not what we're about. They were dead serious. You know what? Let's talk about the practical side of it. It costs more because we've got to buy more toilet paper. Some people, their, their parking lot gets messed up because so many people start showing up. They're parking in the grass and stuff like this. And, and, and you've got so many kids coming that somebody's left a, a stick of chewing gum that got stuck to the chairs. And do you know how much them chairs cost? This, is, this sounds funny, and you guys are laughing, but it's actual arguments that have been given to one pastor after another. If you're not ready for revival, and if you don't want revival, it'll just bust things apart. So you gotta be, and so I've never seen it across the board in so many places where people just really don't want it. You know, messages like I preached last night, they're not so popular. I don't even know if it was popular last night. About hunger and thirst and asking and seeking and knocking because that puts everything on us. That tells us why people aren't being saved and baptized and people, why they're not receiving the Holy Ghost and why the churches aren't full and, and why people aren't being healed and why people aren't having devils cast out and why people aren't being raised from the dead and why we're not what we're supposed to be. And if you think you are, you haven't raised the book of Acts honey God started this thing in power and God's power never runs out God's power gets better it gets richer it gets more you think God started this thing in power just because we needed a little jolt we needed a little bit of a jump start that's what a lot of people believe well they needed that to get things started we need it now we need Holy Ghost we're dying. We're putting on pretty clothes and we're driving to parking lots and pretty cars. And
and we're sitting in pretty sanctuaries. Oh, ain't that just pretty? We need something to mess us up. You better give God praise right there because that was just kind of good. That's just a little bit good right there. If you're Pentecostal and know, if you're Pentecostal enough to know what it's like to have church and the lady, however much time she spent getting her hair pretty, all of a sudden the power of God come and that hair ain't pretty no more. I've seen it, brothers and sisters, and some of you have too. All that time, all that time they spent getting the makeup just right and getting all pretty. And they start crying like this dear sister right here. And the makeup ain't so pretty anymore. I'm not saying she's not pretty. I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying. Lord, help me get back over here. We need the power of God to touch us. So we don't care what we look like. We don't care what somebody thinks about us. We don't care what somebody says about us. We need leadership that doesn't care if they all leave or if they all stay. We're going after Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. You can take this whole world. Just give me Jesus. I'm going to follow after Jesus. I'm chasing. Any God chasers here tonight? Anybody hungry for Jesus tonight? Anybody thirsty for the more of the Lord? Come on, make some noise. Make some noise in this place right now. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. I'm gonna preach on just a little bit more. I'm gonna preach on just a little bit more. Here, here, I've got, to, I've got to get to this conclusion. I've got to make sense of this because I've still got some dots out there. I gave you the middle. I started beginning and I didn't even preach on what I started with. I don't know if you caught that or not. It didn't even make sense what I started with. I started with Jacob being born. He was one of the two in his mom's womb. Okay. I think that's what I read. Something like that. Let me go back here. Where did we start? (sighs) That was in Genesis, wasn't it? Maybe chapter 25? 25. Thank you. Okay, so it's the, the genealogy of, of Isaac, Abraham's son. You get down to uh, verse 23. There's two nations in your womb. Two people should be separated from your body. One should be stronger than the other. The older should serve the younger. Verse 22, look at verse 22. But the children struggled together within her. What was happening? A civil war. A civil war was happening within her. Two things being birthed. Um, one of my favorite authors began, you can't, you can't start a book better than this. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Okay? Two things existing at the same time. How can it be the worst of times and the best of times at the same time? How many of you know that just, it just is sometimes? Maybe it is right now. Two things, two realities existing together and warring against each other. I'm going to talk to you for just a second here about Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. New movie getting ready to come out about Lincoln. I'm going to go see it, I think. I, I, hope it, I hope it does a good job. Because some things in recent years have not done a good job, and I think there has been a war of the enemy. I think it's been spiritual warfare to tarnish the name and the reputation. See, not just the name and reputation, but the anointing of what God wants to release because God wants to bring an impartation of the purity that Abraham Lincoln symbolized, a restoration in this country. God wants to restore America. See, some people preach damnation, some people preach doom and gloom, and some people preach that God's just wiping us out and every bad thing you see is God. And, and you know, there, there is a side of God that is judgment. You know what? I've got hope for America. And I think God does too. I believe we're about to see revival in America.
I really believe it. And I believe God wants to restore America, but America needs to be restored. And so I think God wants to redeem, redeem meaning buy back. I believe God wants to redeem buy back something as pure as what Abraham Lincoln symbolized. And so the enemy seeing this and, and sensing this build up because the enemy is more spiritual than you. The enemy lives in that spiritual or supernatural zone. Okay? Sometimes we get in the spirit. Sometimes we feel, feel the spirit. But the enemy sees what's going up and what's coming down. He's in that spiritual zone. Are y'all with me right now? That's why when the Lord says things like, uh, Upon this rock I'm going to build my church. Well, I know he's speaking of the revelation of, of who Christ is to anybody and everybody. But still yet, he was kind of looking at Simon Peter when he said it. So the enemy will always attack destiny. He will always attack the plan of God. The enemy is not afraid of you for who you are. The enemy is afraid of you for who you are going to be, what God is about to birth in you. That's the reason that the enemy will attack people when they're children. Many great people of God were attacked, maybe even when they were babies or in their mama's womb. You know, The devil wanted to go killing babies. Why? Because he knew something was about to be birthed. Okay. So the enemy senses destiny in the spirit, and he will pick up on it many times before we we do. The enemy pays attention to prophetic words. And that's the reason when, 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 when Jesus is saying like to Peter, even though it's not just Peter, I'm not Catholic, but when he's saying to Peter, if on this rock I'm going to build my church, guess what you see happening very, very, very closely right behind that? You see Jesus saying, well, um, uh, Satan has desired to sift thee as wheat. Well, why did he go and ask for Peter? Why not one of the, because Jesus was just looking at him when he said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. The enemy pays attention to destiny, pays attention to prophetic words. He knows what's up many times. Although he won't know fully, he won't have the understanding of it, but he can sense hot spots. And that's why, listen, anointing attracts attack. And so, something is about to happen, and, it, and there's something pure that God is going to redeem or buy back that was symbolized in Abraham Lincoln. So over the last several years, the enemy, I believe, has been tr trying to tarnish the reputation and the name. There was a book, a biography about Abraham Lincoln that came out a few years ago, and it claimed that Abraham Lincoln was gay. That thing got so much attention. The authors were on CNN and all the news, news channels and, and they were saying, we've got evidence, you know, and blah, 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 and he really was gay. And, and this was, and you know what happened? Now, I'm not saying this was God. I'm not saying it's not. But right the moment the book was released, the dude fell dead. It's true. Then you've had other things that have just kind of made it silly. Made, you know, like Abraham Lincoln, the, the vampire slayer and stuff like that. Just kind of silly stuff. I'm telling you, though, what God really wants to birth, it's about to happen. There's still a buildup. I'm not saying this movie will be it. I have no idea, you know, the stuff about this movie. I just know Tommy Lee Jones is in it. It's all I But anyway, so, <laughs> so anyway, there is, some, <laughs> you think there's not something pure that God wants to release from that guy? How do you be a politician, especially the apex of politicians, become the United States of America president, and still have the nickname Honest? I'm telling you, this is you know, we laugh, but I'm telling you that there's something pure that God wants to release. The spirit of the age just might be a lying spirit. I want you to think about that a second. You don't hear people talking about that and teaching and preaching it, but I really believe the spirit of the age may be a lying spirit because it has become our society and our culture. You cannot do business anymore in America and trust what's taking place. We used to we used to do it with a handshake. We used to be able to trust each other's word. We used to be able to take that to the bank. <laughs> now you make a major transaction, you got to give your you, you got to give your social security number and your blood type and a urine sample and everything. I mean, not really, but sorta. Of. You get the exaggerated point there. I mean, you really got to sign all kinds of documents and you got to have a, an attorney there and then pay attorney fees and and still you might get sued. I mean, we just can't listen. This goes all the way from the car salesman to the White House. There's a, a, a lying spirit that has come over this land. But Abraham Lincoln was known for honesty and integrity. And I, I, would, I would love to talk a whole lot about Abraham Lincoln, but i just got to get to the main points. He was a hard-working man. He was an honest man. He was a praying man. He, he didn't necessarily join a church, but he was a Christian man. He was prophetic. 
I believe the Spirit showed him things. In his last year, he had a dream, two dreams that I'll, I'll mention. One dream, he dreamed and he looked in, in the dream, he looked into the mirror and he seen a double image of himself. The first image was closer to what he looked like. The second was more pale and the second was sickly and the second actually looked dead. And he told his wife the dream and they together realized and got the meaning of the dream. That he survived his first term of presidency, but he'll be dead in the second. Had another dream. His dream was he came into the White House and he said there was crying going on in the White House. He could hear it inside the White House and he was walking through to find the crying. And inside this room in the White House, people were crying. And he goes up to a man and said, Who has died? And the man said to him in the dream, The president. And he goes over to the coffin and he looks and he sees himself. He was prophetic. He was a Christian. He prayed regularly. Somebody asked him. He said, Sir, an interview. He said, Sir, to the president. said, Do you believe that the North, that God is on the side of the North? He said, I don't think of it that way. He said, My great concern is, is the United States of America on the side of God? I mean, that's the president that he was. He, he prayed. But here's the real thing that I want to bring out about Abraham Lincoln. He, he was president during the time of the Civil War. It's the reason for the text. There was this civil war going on within the womb. And then the best of times and the worst of times, this struggle, which is it going to be? Is the good going to win out? Is the weak? Is the dark? Is the right? What's going to win out here? Are we even going to make it through this battle? And I'm telling you what, so is the prophecies of God's goodness going to win out? Or are the prophecies of God's judgment and doom? You know what? I believe they're both from God. You, you, I, I throw you a quarter. I don't know what side you're going to catch it on. Heads or tails. There's two sides to every coin. But you know what? I believe God's calling heads. I believe God's calling heads. And I, you, but so much of this, it depends and, and, and relies on us. See, life and death, blessing and cursing. And He wants us to choose. What are we going to walk? And we have been destined, just like this internal struggle that was going on, and God says, listen, the weaker or the younger, is gonna, He's going to win out. He's going to win out. And I believe that God is saying, hey, it doesn't matter if, it, if you look like you're outnumbered. It doesn't matter what it looks like right now. It doesn't matter if there's hurricanes and fires. It doesn't matter if there's storms. And it doesn't matter if there's bombs and terrorists. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if there's angry preachers telling you it's all going down. I'm telling you, God's saying, if you'll believe in me, I can lift you up and I can raise you up and I can do something still in this nation. And I believe that with everything in me. That's why I'm preaching. I believe it. I believe it. I feel it. I believe it. I've got to declare it. So Abraham Lincoln, president, in a time of civil war, this tension, which is going to win out? What's going to happen? And you know what? This is the thing that he was ultimately known for. Not the civil war, but really I think more than that, what he is known for is this. Come on now. He was known for the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm going to say to you right now what this is. And the reason I'm talking about Lincoln and what is the spiritual application here. What is really God wanting to impart here from Abraham Lincoln? Sure, honesty. Sure, integrity. Sure, he was a hard-working person. Even before he became president, he's a hard-working man. He was a rail splitter here in Illinois. The trail of Abraham Lincoln is from Kentucky where he was born into Indiana where he lived when he moved there. And he lived there for 14 years. Then he moved on to Illinois where he lived and moved here. When he was 21 years old, he was a rail splitter. He was a postal worker. He was a clerk at a general store. He was a hard-working man. He was a fighter. We need some fighters in the body. He was a wrestler. He can whoop just about anybody wrestling. They said one guy, he was wrestling with him and he defeated him with one time. He grabbed him and threw him and it was over. He looked out into the crowd and said, Who's next? And nobody got in. That's Abraham Lincoln. And so he's got my vote. <laughs> you know, he's got my vote. And so anyway, and so Abraham Lincoln, what does God want to re release? All those things are good attributes. But I believe this declaration, this speech that he gave, that's called the Emancipation Proclamation, I believe that's the big kicker right there. See, because what that is, it's verse 44. I've been preaching this 44 thing for years and I've been preaching the resurrection part. That is the first miracle. But the story of 44 has two miracles that must happen. Two miracles. One is coming back to life. But if all we do is come to life, if all we do is get resurrected, we've only got half of the miracle. 
And we've got people in church and they'll come to revival services and maybe they'll get saved. But if all you do is come to the front and get that, that, that jolt of resurrection, you've only got half of the miracle. Because if you go back to your alcohol and your drugs and to, to your life of sin, if you go back and you still got that stuff on you, you've only got half of the miracle if you're still wearing the grave clothes. i got to preach on this for just a second. Give me a few minutes. Give me just a few minutes here. Listen, when David was to become king, he wasn't king yet. He's ready to fight Goliath. What did Saul offer him? His own armor, his own stuff. David tried it on and said, it don't fit. I ain't going to wear that. Listen, we got people wearing things they ain't supposed to wear anymore. John the Baptist came forward. Jesus said he was the greatest born of women. John the Baptist was something, man. He was anointed of God. He was the forerunner. But let me tell you something. He dressed different than any other preacher of his day. He had a different look. He wore something different. He didn't wear, even though he could have and should have, been wearing priestly garments. He was from the priestly lineage on both sides of his family. His mother was a priesthood lineage. His daddy he was a priesthood lineage. John the Baptist would have been a priest. Some people believe he would have became high priest because his lineage was so pure. But instead of being in the temple, we find him in the wilderness alone with God. And when he come forth, he wasn't wearing religion. He wasn't wearing the clothes of the modern church, but he was he was walking in a different look. Guys, I'm telling you, we need something different. And I'm not talking about a suit coat and a tie. I'm not talking about a dress. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, we need to get loosed from everything that's been on us. We need to get yesterday off of us. Hold on, hold on. There is a show. I don't know if it's still on, but it was on. And my wife really liked to watch it, and I'd watch it with her every now and then. You know, just as long as she let me watch my ball games, I'd watch it. It's the way anyway. And so this show was on, and she'd watch it. What not to wear. She, wa- she liked that show so much, she wanted to be on it. And she wanted me to sign her up and volunteer her to be on it. I wasn't doing that. That was no, 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 uh-uh. Even though she wanted to be on it, it would have meant I was signing up my wife to be, no, I wasn't doing that. To be the top person in America of what not to wear. No, 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 I wasn't doing it. So anyway, here's this show, What Not to Wear. And people watch it. Not just what not to wear, but our homes. We've had so many home shows, home makeovers, extreme makeover. And, and we had those shows where neighbors would, would, would exchange, you know, and they'd decorate their house while they'd decorate their house with profession. And we watched all these shows. It was really big for a bit. And, and, and getting our makeovers, whether it be dress or our homes or whatever. And I'm telling you, society is really on the cutting edge of fashion of what looks right and what feels like and certain sounds and all this stuff. But as much, and I heard my kids, I heard one of them say, this was going back several years ago when they were younger, and they'd watch, a, the Disney Channel would be on. And I remember walking through the house one day and the Disney Channel was on and this caught my attention. What was that show? Lizzie McGuire or something like that? Anybody remember that? Okay, thank you. I'm just making sure I didn't make that up. Anyway, so that show was on. I'm walking through the house and I hear one kid on the show say to another kid about their outfit. Oh, that's so yesterday. And I've heard that saying a few times. That's so last week. That's so. And what they're saying is, oh, that looks nice, but it's out of style already. Here's what I'm saying. The church compared to the world. See, the world is really up on what's fresh. The world is really up on things changing, and they want to change with the changes. They want to be in style. They want to have their, their, their clothes in style, and they want to have their houses with the modern, you know, and all this stuff. We like to change. We like to change the color, and to change the paint, and we change the style, and all this stuff. Change, change, change. We can change our bodies. I ain't going to get into that, but we do. The problem is, the world can be on the cutting edge of what's new and hot and changing, but the world is slower than Christmas when it comes to anything changing. We're suspect. 
about new songs and new styles and new colors of carpets and, you know, new arrangements of the seating and anything new. We're suspect. We get our little religious censors up. And, and we've not done it that way before. And we've always done it this way. And, and we get all these problems that are caused because somebody did something new or sang something new or did it in a, you know, people, pastors have had big problems just because they went to the pulpit one Sunday without a tie on. And you think, well, that's funny. Well, no, 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 it's not funny. It happens. It happens. People get upset. I used to think that was a joke, that, that church people would get really mad when they laid new carpet and it wouldn't be the color that somebody liked. I'm telling you, whole families, 20 and 30 people will leave at a time because it's green instead of maroon. I mean, it's silly. We, we have such a problem with change we got, listen, I, I live in Kentucky, and in Kentucky we have, the, we have the, the fastest horses in the world in Kentucky. And even if they're born somewhere else, they'll bring them to Kentucky to be trained. Or, or they'll br bring horses and they'll, they'll have them bred in Kentucky. Or they, if they're somewhere else, they'll, they'll bring them to Kentucky to race them in Kentucky. So the fastest horses in the world will come to Kentucky. And you know what we do with the fastest horses in the world? We take them out to this track. And we, we sound a horn. And we sound that horn. Them horses take off running. The fastest horses in the world. And you know where they get to? Nowhere. And they run in a big circle. We got the fastest basketball players, and we make some of the fastest cars. The Corvette comes out of Kentucky. You know what? Kentucky is one of the slowest nations. <laughs> My dear goodness. We are so behind the times. And what we're doing is we're running in circles. Not getting anywhere. And God wants to release the war horse to break the cycle because we just keep going up and down, in and out, round and round, and we keep experiencing the same stuff. And God wants to break that spirit so we can go for it and get what's new and what's fresh. So God's got to get some stuff off of the church so that we can get something new. Listen, God likes new things. He made you a new creature, gave you a new name. He gave you a new nature. He's making a new heaven, a new earth. God likes new things. He wants you to sing a new song. New song. Old Testament said, sing a new song to me. New Testament, he said, sing a new song. God likes new things. I'm not getting any amens on the new things. God likes new things. So God wants to do a new thing. Sometimes the new thing is just a discovery of the old thing. So don't get mad at me because the new things are going to happen, but the old things are going to happen too. It's the outpouring of the latter and the former and the former and the latter together. But we got to have room for the new things. And God wants to put a new thing on us. And for him to put a new thing on us, we got to take something off of us. we got to take death off of us. Listen, there are some places they went to minister the gospel, minister revival, and when they went, they were not received. People didn't want to hear it. People weren't hungry. People weren't thirsty. People weren't ready for it, whatever. And Jesus said, when you go to a place like that, walk out, and what did he say? Shake the dust off your feet. What's he saying? Don't walk in that anymore. Don't let the lingering effects of what you've been walking in be part of your path into tomorrow. And some of you have been walking through dead stuff and you've been in a dead season. God wants you to shake that off tonight. And you're not, listen, I'm telling you and declaring in the name of Jesus, this is a new day for you. It's a new anointing. Psalm 89, 10, He anoints your head with fresh oil. He's giving you a new anointing. It's a new day. This is not just, listen, it's not just cliche. God's really wanting to put something fresh on you. How many are up for something fresh, something new? power of God come on you. So we got to get the old off. We got to get, we, we got to turn Saul's uh, armor down. We got to be like John the Baptist. We can't wear what everybody else has been wearing. The church needs something fresh and new. And here's the deal. When the dude came out, Lazarus, I called him dude. We've gotten close over the years. <laughs> Lord help me. When La Lazarus, Luke makes fun of my paraphrases. <laughs> Lazarus, when Lazarus comes forth out of that thing, out of that thing, out of the grave, when he comes out of the grave, Lazarus, out of the grave, that's the miracle. The second part of the miracle is loose. And you know what that is? It's the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay? So I believe the first part of the miracle is this. Jesus groaning in himself. He's fired up. He's feeling it. He's emotional and he's spiritual all at the same time. And he's walking toward the grave. He said, where's he at? And they said, and he's crying. And then after he cries a while, he starts groaning in himself. And he starts walking toward the, toward the tomb, which was a, a cave. And it had a stone. And he rolled away the stone. They rolled away the stone. And Jesus, now get me, get me right here. I'm going to start closing right here. I'm going to start closing. But give me just two or three minutes. 
Jesus said, roll away the stone. They rolled away the stone, and Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come out of your grave. Lazarus, come out of your pit. Come out of your dark place. Come out of that hole you've been in. Lazarus, come out of that dark place. Come out of that hole. Come out of that grave. Come out of what you've been stuck in. Lazarus, come forth. Come forward. Don't be stuck anymore. Don't be stationary anymore. Don't be dead anymore. Don't be just laying there anymore. Lazarus, hear my voice. Lazarus, come forth. And when Lazarus heard him, Lazarus got up. And Lazarus wasn't dead anymore. And somehow, Lazarus came forth. And the Bible says he came forth. And I don't know how he did this. I'll tell you this joke real quick. It's not a joke. It's a real life thing. But I was in church and I get to feeling God. And sometimes I just hop. Ooh, hallelujah. I hop and I praise God. And I love God. And I pray. And I hop and I preach. And I hop. You know, I just feel God. And so I was doing that in the church. And I didn't realize nobody else was doing it. And the preacher next to me says, hey. After I'd been doing it a while, says, hey. How come you do that? And I am not a quick-witted person. I'm the kind of person that thinks of smart-alecky stuff to say after you've already walked away. I think, oh, I should have told them this, and I should have said that. Stuff's coming to me the next day of what I should have done, you know. But this was God. I'm blaming this smart-alecky remark on God. It just, boom, with no thought, it came up out of me. And I'd just been hopping and bouncing, and he said, why do you do that? And I said, oh, I learned that from my buddy Lazarus. He said, huh? I said, yeah, I used to be dead like you. (laughs) But Jesus called my name, (laughs) and I've been hopping toward the Lord ever since. See, because Lazarus in grave clothes all wrapped, how did he get to Jesus? He must have came hopping out through, you know. I'm telling you what religion will do. Religion hates the spirit, the dead spirit of religion. The spirit of religion hates noise and movement. It's made uncomfortable. Noise, being loud, being crazy. It makes religion nervous. And movement, somebody moving or shaking or bending or running or walking or feeling, it makes religious spirits nervous. They said to Jesus, you better settle your people down. He said, no, I ain't going to settle them down. If they shut up, then the rocks will start crying. God doesn't mind our noise. God likes our energy. God likes, listen, if you don't like it here, you're going to have a hard time in heaven. There's a whole lot going on up in heaven. Whole lot going to be going on when we get there in heaven. It's going to be a party. It's going to be a jamboree. It's going to be, I don't even know what that is, but it's going to be good. Hallelujah. So here's the deal. Lazarus is brought forth. I got to close. Lazarus is brought forth. He's alive. Woo, he's coming. And then Jesus says this to them. Verse 44. Loose him and let him go. Here's what I believe. Everybody stand with me so I'll actually start closing. Here's what I believe is about to happen. We're about to experience this. I believe we're, we're certainly going to experience revival. But see, that's, that's, it's not just revival. Because if we think of it just like that, it's going to be like, oh, a bunch of good services. And that's not what we have in store for us. Not just a bunch of good services. It's something more than that. And God is going to totally loose us of all the deadness that we've been walking in. He's going to totally let us get it off of us. <laughs> He's going to totally let us, everything that's right. Ra- Listen, when they came out of Egypt, they were wearing Egyptian clothes. Sometimes you've got to get your yesterday off of you. Some people can't go into their mo- to tomorrow until they... Listen, Jesus said, remember not the former things. I'm going to do a new thing. As long as you're looking back to whatever hurts you or whatever reward. Some people can't get on to, to tomorrow because of their glory days. We've got trophies of how good it was, the good old days. I'm telling you what, there are no good old days. Get your eyes off of your yesterday and start moving toward what God wants to do. And so the Lord's got to get that off of us so we can move on. And we're going to move on in the power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's what the Lord wants to do. There is a spirit of emancipation, proclamation, getting ready to come to the body of Christ. A loosing, a freedom. And I don't know. I can't put my finger on it yet. I don't know fully what that means. So I ain't even going to try to preach it. I'm going to stop right here. But God's about to bring a loosing to us. And I bet we can handle it. I bet we can stand a good loosen. I bet we need some more freedom. I, I, I bet we, we... Listen, we come to church. 
we got stuff on us and worries and problems and things, you know. We're not, we're, and to that spirit of religion, no matter what kind of church you go to, it's going to try to get on you. And you get used to sitting in the same place and standing in the same place and doing the same nothing. You get used to all that. Did you notice that little <laughs> jab there? <laughs> Boom. Gotcha. <laughs> I wasn't being mean. We're all laughing, see? (laughs) But the problem is we get used to coming and standing in that same place and sitting in that same place and doing that same nothing. We get used to it. We start expecting that's what we're supposed to, when it's not what we're supposed to to do or be. There's more. I want to shout that for everything in me. There's more than this. Give me one good amen. There's more than this. Jesus is growling and shouting at Lazarus to come up and he's, he's feeling something, man, and he's calling Lazarus out of that. Come out of that. Come out of that. Come out. And I believe he's doing that with the church. He's calling us out. But he's also, he's also wanting to release over America this impartation, this anointing, like what was on Abraham Lincoln, an emancipation proclamation. And I believe God's wanting to release that on America that we'll be loose, we'll be free once again. Free in the Spirit. Amen? Everybody raise both hands. Everybody raise both hands. I want to pray a prayer. Father, your will be done tonight. Lord, loose us tonight. Loose us to receive. Lord, just knock off doubt and unbelief and knock off... Knock off our today and our yesterday. Let us accept and receive the new. What you want tonight, let it happen tonight. We thank you that you've spoke to us. And we thank you, God, for everything that's happened. But we say, what else, what next? What else, what next? What else, what next? What you want to do, go ahead and do it. Lord, I just pray for every person that they won't have the mentality that somebody else is getting ready to get something. I pray that every person here would get something. I pray that every single person here would get a little dose of the Holy Ghost tonight, God. Oh, Sharabaka, a great dose, a great dose. A great dose of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, 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 Holy I remember going out cruising my first time in my new car when I was, what, a new car, but to me it was when I was 16 years old and I ran out of gas. It taught me a lesson then that I've never forgotten, although I have ran out of gas a time or two since then. But I ran out of gas and this is what it taught me. As long as I drive a car, I'm going to be dependent on a gas filling station. Listen, we as people of God... We minister out. We pour out. We possess this treasure in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels were cheap. They were inexpensive. And they were common commodity. If they did crack them or break them, you know what they do? They take them to the edge of the city where most villages had a a heap for the broken shards of the earthen vessel. Sometimes the earthen vessel was made out of, uh, of mud, actual clay, and sometimes it was made out of animal skin. In the animal skin, um, the apostles said, he had a thorn in his flesh. See, flesh would be that earthen vessel that's made out of the skin. The, the thorn in the skin is going to cause that to what? It's going to cause it to leak out. It's going to cause it to leak out. That's us. We're earthen vessels. We're earthen vessels that can get easily cracked or, and chipped. And, and all, when you get a crack or a chip in a, a ceramic something another glass something that what's it going to do it's going to leak out it's it's no good so they would just take them and throw them in, in big heaps at the edge of the village or the city but folks we we so serve the master potter and he doesn't throw the clay away and we get used up and we get broke and chipped and, and all that stuff it's it, it, listen it makes us dependent on god and even when we're doing the best of stuff when you're doing ministry and when you're doing God work and you're doing good, you're pouring out. You're pouring out. You're giving of yourself. Jesus came to be broken and spilled out. It's okay to get empty. It really is. It's okay to get empty. It's okay to realize, wow, I'm not feeling anything. It's, it's okay to feel like, man, I don't have a shout in me. But what you do when you recognize that is you just go get filled again. The feeling that what God gives us is not meant to be a one-time thing. We're just, just like a car is always dependent on a filling station. You are always dependent on God. He wants the excellency of the power to be from Him and us to know that it's from Him and not us. 
We've got to become and have the awareness that we are a dependent, not independent. We are a dependent people. We need Him. We need His power. We need the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Can I have an amen on that? If you're here tonight and you say, you know what? I need a feeling of the Holy Ghost. I need a fresh... Only if you've already had this experience. If you've already had this experience and you think, man, I know what God is. I know what His power is. I know what His touch is. I know what His anointing is. I know what it feels like. I know what it looks like. I know what it does to me. And I'm not so full right now. I don't come in here feeling overflowing full tonight. If that's you, I want you to get out of your seat and come up front real quick. Do it quick. Do it quick. Do it quick.